Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another podcast from Logistics Executive Group. My name is Andrea Sewell. I'm a business intelligence specialist here in our Dubai offices, and I'll be stepping in for our host, Kim Winter, this week. As usual, please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Logistics Executive TV, for all of our vodcasts and business insights. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Hermione Parsons, Industry Professor and Director for the Center for Supply Chain and Logistics at Deakin University. Hi, Hermione. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Lovely to see you. It's good to see you as well. Um, you are in Australia, yes? That's right, in Melbourne, Australia, where we're locked down under curfew uh, because of the pandemic. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your house. I hope it's a nice place to be right now. I'm very fortunate. I'm one of the lucky ones, yes. All right. Good to know. Um, so before we get into our main questions, Hermione, why don't you give the audience a bit more of an intro to yourself your, and your career background? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, my career background, I've been in logistics and supply chain for about 30 years. Um, I fell into logistics and then I fell into supply chain and I've been very fortunate to fall into both. Uh, in terms of logistics, I was in my 20s and I was doing, I was going to have babies, I was pregnant and decided to do a master's degree in urban planning at Melbourne. Lucky for me, I lived over, across the river from the port of Melbourne and I was fascinated by every day what I was seeing with the port system, the equipment, the container line queue, the key line the containers and cranes and the ships and the ships with containers and different flags and different names and the whole thing fascinated me. So that's how I fell into logistics. I did my master's in the port, port system and multimodal logistics as freight moved across the port city interface. Um, I was still having babies, so I went into a PhD into the fresh produce industry, which was, again, I fell into it. I was going to do advanced manufacturing, but a letter came to us from the wholesale markets of Australia saying they had this big problem. They couldn't understand what was happening, but the supermarkets were bypassing the traditional horticultural industry and they wanted help to understand what was happening. And that, of course, was the supply chain big supply chain changes of the 90s with um, retail. So that was my PhD. And I worked for about 10 years in the fresh fruit and vegetable industry, having a magnificent time with B2B trading systems and all sorts of really innovative programs. And um, that was fabulous. Then moved into government for as a technical specialist for about five years. And that took me into every major infrastructure project for freight and supply chain. So whether it was ports, channel deepening, road, rail, IT systems, regulatory systems, competition issues, it was a fabulous few years. It taught me about government, which was a very good thing for a person to know. Yeah. And then um, moved to the Port of Melbourne as the strategic planner for the landside strategy. Uh, that was a great few years. And then I was very fortunate to be offered the directorship of this new thing called a Centre for Supply Chain Logistics. Um, and I've been there for 10 years. And in those years, I've developed this partnership program approach. So everything we do is applied research, applied education, development, working in with some of the best people in the industry, great supporters in industry, great partnerships. So that's in a nutshell, me and my career. That's, yeah. that's actually a really interesting story. I mean, Usually, I mean, I grew up in Jamaica, in Kingston, actually, very close to um, the, the port. And I didn't see the same things as you. Most enough, I saw the fishermen come in and out. And I just wanted to spend my weekends going fishing. So I think we saw, <laughs> we saw the same thing, but we saw very different things from it. So that's very interesting. Well, I, grew up as a, I grew up fishing earlier, so I, I, I was already had that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So talking about the Center for Supply Chain and Logistics, you have done some research and some of the notes that you've actually shared with me, you mentioned that coming out of COVID, we do need more resilient supply chains and these more resilient supply chains, they leverage all available talent and the power of diversity and knowledge generation. And so we are in typically a male dominated industry being supply chain and what i really wanted to know is how have you seen the industry change for women throughout your career well there have been a number of changes um, one is there are far more women in supply chain and logistics companies now 
but we still have, um, and we have a lot more women in some decision-making positions. But I think the tendency has been the more senior you become in your career, the less females there are in every room. And the, um, the lower the ratio in terms of uh, female to male. So that's a common, and I think that continues. Um, but one of the big changes, I think, is the numbers of women and the proportions of women in companies. So at, say, industry events, conferences, you'll see lots of women. But very often, those women work in the support services. So they're working in HR, PR, comms, they're working in admin, finance. They're not actually working in supply chain and logistics, in logistics and supply chain, in the decision-making aspects or sides of the business. And that's where we still have an enormous amount of work to do. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the focus of a lot of the work that we have and that we focus upon. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely understand what you mean because throughout um, my time with logistics executive, I have met a lot of uh, women in supply chain, but I think you are right. They have sat in marketing, in HR. They haven't really been in the operations. And so from that, how do you think the supply chain industry can succeed in creating and supporting the development of more women in the supply chain, in, in well, the jobs here? Well, the critical issue is that the women need to be in the areas of supply chain, in logistics and supply chain, in dis decision-making roles, and operations is often the absolute fundamental. You have to understand the operations to be able to do the other um, more senior roles and to be able to make great decisions in operations as well. And so that there is still a challenge for our logistics and supply chain um, companies, and also for the public sector, because the public sector is making a lot of decisions that relate to supply chain logistics, particularly now in the pandemic. But this is a constant uh, issue about how do we build the uh, capability of decision makers in the public and the private sector and this is a very big challenge that we need to look at in a number of ways. Yeah. One, getting the best teams, making sure we have the best talent, the best capable people there. Um, but also it's a, a, a system, it's a situation of mathematics. That is, if companies, and if companies are only recruiting from 50% of the population, in no way are they capturing the real talent and the real ability and the capability. So this is simple maths as well in terms of say in Australia, where we have a great problem with talent and capability in the supply chain world. And that is because the average age of people in the companies is in their late forties and their fifties. Yeah. Uh, no real um, pipeline of people coming along as replacements. And at the same time, the complexity of the task grows daily, now minute by minute, minute by minute with the pandemic. And we have um, great complexity with e-commerce, with Industry 4.0, with technology, now with volumes in terms of the pandemic and the changes there. So the complexity of the task is, is huge. The freight volumes are increasing um, as a matter of, of course with e-commerce, et cetera. And therefore we have even greater need to make sure that we get the, the talent and the capability of our uh, sector and our industry, right? So we've got a lot of work to do. Definitely. And I think uh, you talk about the fact that uh, they, the people in the supply chain, the work in, people who are currently working in the supply chain, they're a lot older. They're in their early 40s, mid 40s. What do you think companies can do to make supply chain more attractive to both women, supply chain jobs more attractive to both women, but also to younger people? Yeah, this is a really big issue and we've just done some very interesting research on it involving over 100 women. We focused on women. It was in a program that we call Wayfinder Supply Chain Careers for Women and it was funded by the 16 corporations that fund that program and also a group called Food Innovation Australia Limited. Um, so it's a partnership program. And this research we've, we've just, just finishing, so these are the preliminary findings, but the preliminary fly, findings show that of course, millennials are going to be, um, by 2025, will be 75% of the global workforce. That millennials have a very different um, upbringing in terms of technology, social media, open plan offices, when they were relevant pre-pandemic, yeah. um, to the Gen X and the baby boomer decision makers in companies. Um, that the 
the and the well-known stuff about the millennials and in terms of sort of seamlessly um, switching to remote, um, but their lifestyle issues, the values are different, um, the interests are different, and this I think poses a great challenge to current decision-making companies that are based on older sets of people. So the issues of loyalty, the issues of less stressful jobs, changing jobs more frequently, all of these are very significant cultural changes to companies um, in the public and the private sector. And so that if the new normal, and our research shows that the new normal is likely to be non-linear pathways um, for people, then the current um, decision-making executives and senior managers need to be thinking very differently about how are they going to um, build the capability and attract people into these industries, particularly when in Australia anyway, our research shows that the same sorts of groups of people, women who say have mathematics or STEM sort of base subjects behind them, um, particular types of capable people. These are the ones that are being sought by every different type of industry, not just supply chain. So we do need to work hard to create an image, not a new image, but an image. And that's another a big finding. Probably the, the, a few other things that we found, which we think are terribly important, is that the women are saying very clearly, you can't be what you can't see. And so we do need more women in senior positions, in the executive positions, senior management positions in the public and the private sector to encourage others uh, to participate and to aspire to those roles. Um, I think there are, there are two other things that I'd like to suggest are, are really also there. And it is clear from our research that without doubt, there are some parts of the industry that remain very sexist in their treating of the treatment of women. And this has to be, this has to be addressed head on. Uh, and it is being addressed head on by so many companies, but it still exists. I would say in some of the companies more in the operation side, but it is a, an ongoing issue that cannot be uh, forgotten. It is there. It's not just about the positives of how do we build and offer and create new opportunities. It's also about stopping the behavior that means that people go to other industries. We want to keep the women and the young people in supply chain and to attract them because the image of the, and the importance of what we do is significant. But we also need to recognize that one of the really smart things about young women and women and young um, men as well, is that they are now choosing which companies they go to and being quite selective. They're, they're doing the research so that they will select the companies that align to their values. And I think this is a really, really important part of our research that um, will influence the decision makers, I think, in terms of building capability. Okay. Now that's, that's, that's a lot to take in. I think I don't, I didn't realize that by 2025, 75% of the workforce were going to be millennials. That is a shocking number, actually. <laughs> that's <laughs> it, a shocking number. It means number. a lot of change. A lot of a change is at foot. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely agree with the fact that um, myself and a lot of my friends included are being very selective with the values of the companies that we choose to go for, um, looking at the workplace ballots, looking through Glassdoor just to see what our employees there currently saying. Um, definitely, I don't think I know anyone who's gone for a job interview without looking at the Glassdoor just to see. So yeah. huge changes. Well, that is a huge change from, from the last few decades of people who didn't do that yeah. and who stayed, who were loyal, who stayed in one organisation. There are such differences culturally between groups of people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So industry professor and director for the Centre of Supply Chain and Logistics at Deakin University. So a lot of education going on there. How do you think the education and training system can maybe be redesigned to more effectively develop the skills that the sector needs because a lot of attracting the new talent and attracting the women, the young people, they're gonna to need to be trained for it. I mean, we, you, you mentioned that women can't do what they can't see, but also we won't have the women in leadership if they, they don't have the skills to be in the role at the present. So 
how do you think supply chain education needs to change in, in order to attract more people or prepare I'd them for those? I would say significantly. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll put it this way, that um, the, the rules of, with the pandemic, it is clear that the rules have changed. And it is clear with the confluence of a number of factors, industry 4.0, e-commerce, technology, and then you whack in pandemics, natural disasters, these sorts of issues, um, climate change, you, you add these things together. And it is clear to me that um, we need to approach education and training in a very different way. The first point is uh, on the demand side, I believe companies need to invest a lot more, a lot more in this issue. And this is not because I'm at a university. Our centre doesn't teach. We, we just do PhD supervision. Um, so I'll put that, put that out there. Um, the rest of the university does, but, but our centre doesn't. Mm -hmm. But you know, with everything we do, we have a talent capability laboratory that's led by um, uh, fabulous people in our industry. Um, and... These people are so, so clear about the need for a different way um, to build the resilience of our supply chain through people. So education and training needs to be done differently. I was lucky enough to do sort of little study tours um, a few years ago of the best centres, institutes and universities across the world in terms of the provision of supply chain logistics. And what became really clear to me was that what we're doing is the same as a number of places where we emphasize everything is applied. It has to be demand driven. It has to be demand led. It has to be a partnership of industry, government and academia working together to define what is needed. And then that needs to determine the education and the training that can be provided. But we, we have to think very differently. The pandemic is showing such acute problems and those problems are based on, uh, those problems are very much based on um, the, the way in which training and education has been offered in the past. Um, it's often been very linear and the linear nature of that training has meant that say, the complexity of the current situations that we're dealing with is to some extent beyond people that have been linear in their thinking. So we need to be building agility, um, complex problem solving, which is not the way we've been, our education programs necessarily have been developed in relation to supply chain over the last um, number of decades. So we need to be going at this in a very different way. Industry must invest, businesses need to invest more in this space, particularly because the same industries are competing for the same people that the supply chain world wants to pick up. So this is a different world. This is a very different world. And the building the capability of people has, in my view, is the most important thing for the future and the sustainability of businesses and, um, and this sector going forward. Definitely. Hermione, I think you've left the audience with a lot to talk about and just a lot to think about. And the training, I mean, some of the business leaders that are going to be listening to this, when they listen to it, I hope they sit back and they just let it mellow. They understand that actually investment in education and training is going to be very important going forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Andrea. Lovely yeah. to meet you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. And to all our um, viewers at Logistics Executive TV, thank you very much for tuning in. I will include all the links to Hermione's LinkedIn profile uh, in the caption of the video, and I will ensure to get it out to everyone. Hermione, thank you so much. Thank to all our audience, bye-bye.